round of applause to Frank. Well, firstly, I want to say thank you to my small but very captive audience uh, for, uh, for coming along and having a listen. Thank you very much. So um, I just uh, wanted to focus on what is something that I've been very, very passionate about and working very, very heavily and closely with, which is what I would say is the you know, future of education, um, which is a very, very big business and something that um, I've put a lot of time and effort into over the last few years. And so without any further ado, I will click onto it. So for me, you know, when I've, we started working in this field, um, it really came down to some very, very important areas that we find are, are really crucial when it comes to, to education, especially as, you know, from a, from a younger generation where, you know, the, the play, creating and discovery of things to actually truly, truly understand core concepts is what we really want to get to. We, we can see working with, um, working with kids is that the kids are, uh, you know, a 10-year-old is infinitely smarter about the digital age than his 15-year-old brother or sister. And a 15-year-old is infinitely much smarter than, than we are. And so what we're trying to do is focus on how, how do the elements of playing and, and creating and discovery truly help you understand core concepts. Um, I'm just going to give you just a little background about myself and why I'm, st why I'm standing here in front of you. So I've been an um, investor and um, entrepreneur for, for quite some time. Uh, I was on the board of uh, Spotify, I was on the board of Siri, I was on the board of uh, Sumly, which we just sold to Yahoo recently, and, and a whole bunch of other stuff uh, when I was uh, working in a VC firm called Horizons Ventures. And I've also started a number of companies um, which have done pretty well. And I'm going to talk to you about some of those, particularly the latest one, which was in the field of education. Um, so uh, we uh, discovered, as a firm, we discovered Nick um, in, um, in his bedroom in Wimbledon in, uh, in uh, about this time, about two years ago. And, you know, when it comes to the future of education, Nick is a perfect example of what actually it, it will become, basically. So Nick, Nick Delosio, so we found Nick when he'd, he started when he was 11, he li was living in Wimbledon, and he started when he was 11 writing some apps, and by the time he was 14, he'd already um, made about $30,000, $35,000, and so instead of actually going out and blowing it on the beach or everything else that I used to do, um, he decided to go and hire some MIT professors and a couple of guys in Israel to go and write an algorithm. And the algorithm was because he'd had this idea about how do you summarize text? How do you find the most interesting pieces of text and bring it out and summarize it? And we saw this little article about it and Nick had arranged all of this from his bedroom in Wimbledon, right? He'd never, he'd never even told his parents what he was up to. Um, and, and so he goes out and he finds, he finds some investment um, and actually, so the VC firm that I was, uh, was working for um, is the VC firm of Li Ka Shing, who's the ninth, tenth richest guy in the world, based in Hong Kong. And, um, and so basically, we came in and we invested, you know, 300,000 into, into Nick's early company. And that was the first time he had to go and tell his parents what he was doing, which was that somehow from his bedroom in Wimbledon, he'd managed to get 300,000 from the ninth richest guy sitting in Hong Kong. And which is a kind of a case for if you, you know, you can find investment, you just have to work on it. But Nick is a very, very interesting example. Now Nick is actually by no means at all a, an exception. He's a very, he's a fantastic guy, very articulate, born salesman. But as soon as we invested in Sumley, I started getting twe tweets from huge range of 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds all up with the, the latest idea and wanting to get in touch. And they came from everywhere, you know, from Portland, down in South Australia, which is where I grew up, which is truly in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, from Hong Kong, Russia, whatever, it doesn't matter. We, we, we started getting a lot of interest from, from a bunch of kids. And now I've actually invested into a, a new bunch of 15 year olds who are about to launch a new app coming up um, at the end of this year. And it was fascinating to see how these kids were very creative, 
very into uh, technology, I mean, obviously into technology, but they were also very, I mean, out there playing sport, out there doing loads and loads of cool things, which frankly, I rang the computer club when I was a kid in the 80s and it was not cool. And, and basically in those days, you know, but now it is and everybody gets very involved in it and the kids, but the kids of course are teaching themselves. You know, Nick taught himself, all these guys, you know, the, the two kids I'm investing in now taught themselves, all these guys are practicing, they all taught themselves, right? There is no real coding education in the schools. And of course, at the same time, STEM education, you know, all the schools are totally, all the education systems around the world are totally focused about it. It's not just, it's not a problem here, it's not just a problem in the US, it's a problem everywhere. And everybody's struggling to figure out how to get there, but the problem is, of course, is the kids are infinitely smarter than the students. So I have a little six-year-old and, you know, at school, he's learning to, you know, how to do point and click and use the browser. And like him and his mates are like so far ahead of the teacher that's teaching him and they're only six. And they're like, you know, they're telling, they're telling <laughs> Mr. poor old Mr. Mackay, their teacher, what to do, how to use the iPad. Mr. Mackay, you need to do this, you know, and it's like, it's, but it's so hard for how do you, how do you keep up with that? And that is the, that is the challenge. I mean, no matter how much governments, it's not the fault of the teacher by any means. It's not the fault of the school by any means. It's simply the fact that the way digital the digital education of the kids is moving so fast is that they cannot, the school simply can't keep up. And how on earth can a kind of a government run curriculum keep up with that pace of change? And so, you know, a lot of people blame teachers in the schools. I don't see that as an issue at all. My dad's a teacher. He's t taught computer science in high school for, for 20, 30 years. And, you know, he just about manages to keep up. But it's very, very difficult. So I think something has to radically change. And it has to change in terms of how the, school, the system adapts rather than just trying to keep it up, up going on a curriculum basis because you know, everybody's out there talking about curriculum change and coding and everything. And I swear to God, by the time they've actually figured out what they're actually going to t teach and set from a curriculum viewpoint in the coding viewpoint, code has already moved on. It will be some other language and they're teaching a language which is two or three years out of date. So they've, they've, they literally have to figure this out and they have to somehow keep up pace with Nick and his peers um, and my little six-year-old who told me, you know, a few days ago he wants to start a business and he wants to start a website and as I was trying to put him to sleep because he needs to talk to me via a website because he figured that was the only way to talk to me. But that was one of, the, one of the things I actually finally figured out why he wanted to do that. But it is a massive, massive opportunity. And, okay, you know, I think obviously Salman Khan and... and Daphne Kohler, who founded Coursera, etc. They're all, everybody's working in a pace of, in, into change. But I see these things as even, you know, only really stage one. Stage one, really, in education, when it comes to the Khan Academy, when it comes to Coursera, etc., has literally been taking material which was once the preserve of a privileged few and distributing it out from a digital perspective, just distributing it out but there is really still no real interaction coming back. So at the end of the day, the kids are still sitting there, they're watching, they're watching something, they're reading a PowerPoint, they're watching a video, etc. But when they have a question, who do they ask and how do they truly understand a concept? And it's not going to be by reading, I mean, literally all we're doing is distributing the information. And that's great, but literally the kids are still not understanding the core concepts. They understand the core concepts when they build something, when they design something, when they do something. And that's when they truly understand a core concept. The other thing is as well is that, is that what's incredibly interesting is how the enrol of parents is getting bigger and bigger. What we call the supplementary school education market, so that's the, that's the education, the non-school education market is already $103 billion this year. That's how much parents are spending around the world on their kids. And you know, we studied this greatly and we found that there was a very, very strong pattern around the world with a few countries and exceptions. But basically, in Western countries, what kind of happens is parents throw a lot of money at their kids up to the age of six. So buy lots and lots of apps, lots of books, lots of everything, etc. And then they come into sort of year one and year two and they like hand them over to the school. And the school sort of, they like, okay, cool, school's gonna take care of this now. 
And then what happens is they start doing entrance exams around 10, 11, and they realize that little Johnny is not as smart as they thought he was, and they panic, and they start throwing shed loads of money again. And, and so basically what happens is that you get this, this huge amount of money being spent on 11 up on private tutoring, tutoring classes, etc. And these systems are very, very old. And again, the kids are sitting there in these extra classes and they're like, seriously, the Cumon system is like, you sit there with pencil and paper and the kids are like, huh? Like, why are we, you know, why, why, why? You know, like, why are we doing this ancient system? And so it's incredibly difficult for the kids to get engaged. So I think disruption is important, but disruption so far has kind of happened in terms of classic entrepreneurial, let's just chuck it out there but it's still not truly understanding exactly what a core issue and what a core concept is. So I started, I started about 18 months ago, a studio here in London and Palo Alto, where we, we build um, educational games, but not educational games as you ever thought of them, as you can see from the pictures there. So this, is our, this was our first one, which was basically teaching kids how to code, um, and it's teaching them JavaScript, HTML, but they literally play a game. So these warring robots, it's a game called Hikitsu, and these robots basically are in a sort of a, a battle arena, and you have to basically move and kill the other robots, which in a multiplayer game or a single player game, by code. You've literally, you cannot move it until you actually code. And the very interesting thing is, is this was about our fourth prototype, and we realized that the kids just didn't want any instructions, they just wanted to do it. So they just go straight into it, they battle away, and they figure out how to code unbelievably quickly. We don't even bother to explain it. They, there's lots of stuff around the game where they can understand and learn stuff around the game, but actually getting, they just want to get to it. And once they're doing it, and when they're in there, they get it. And so what we do, and, and as you can see, you know, it feels like a game. It's not homework, but, you know, it's... It, it, and it's of a high enough quality for the kids to actually relate to. And that's, that's also super important. So as I was saying beforehand, I think this, this distribution of things through with Coursera, um, and then even more interesting what's coming up now eventually in the next few years is AI-driven smart tutoring. So that tutoring, where you, when we get to that point of where I said you've got this distribution thing of where you've just got huge amounts of information going out, but the kids are not able to relate to it or understand it, what's going to happen is, of course, if, you know, I did tutoring to get myself through university, and you sit down, and you're with a kid, and you're trying to get them through the core concepts, and you don't sit there and go, oh, mate, can you just do, like, a hundred questions for me in this hour, and then I will come back again, because that wasn't going to help at all. Like you literally sit down and you really, really over and over again try to get a core concept through to them. And now what you know, a lot of people are trying to do is to do that through AI and to figure out how to get that into an AI-driven tutoring system, smart tutoring system, so that you will be able to interact with software. And so you know, what my dream would be is that the ability of a you know, university class tutor could be available to everyone in, you know, whether it's whatever country that is. And I, you know, in India or US or UK, the, the kid would have the ability to do that and that would able to be complementing the teachers in a great way because the teacher would be able to go, okay, cool. All right, straight out here, here's a whole bunch of iPads in front of me. Right, kids, you guys are going to go off and do the next, I need you to do chapter eight, section five of these questions. And immediately on their iPad, on the teacher's iPad, he's going to be seeing that this kid is flying ahead and this kid is struggling. And immediately can go over there and either the, the software can help them directly, and if he's finding that the software is not helping, he can go in there straight away and help. And you think about it from a, a class size of 30 to 35 people, 40 kids, you know, class sizes are increasing all the time. That's very, very interesting because previously teachers really could only concentrate on the top five and the bottom five kids. The rest of the kids kind of muddled their way through. And what you really want to do is you want to be able to see which kid is moving really fast and which kid is moving really slow. And without sort of that interaction, if you've got, that's the great thing about digital feedback is that if we've got that information coming back, we have a really, really interesting thing going on. And so what I'm, what I'm doing a lot these days as well 
is, is working with education establishments and schools and et cetera in how to, how to figure out how to implement those systems you know, in very, very low cost ways. I mean, most of this stuff can be done without putting in stupidly huge expensive systems into schools and you know, figuring out ways to actually show how those educational feedback and implementations and smart ways of getting kids into, you know, digital, digital savvy kids integrated into the classroom and those who aren't so savvy integrated as well. That's a balance that's really, really crucial. Um, this is one of my favourite picks, um, which is kind of the way it's going in the future. You know, the kid is pretty much born on top of an iPad these days. So, I mean, any of you guys who, you know, who see, um, who have kids or, or see parents with kids these days, an iOS device is a, a godsend, right? Be that an iPad, be that an iPhone, there it goes. It's embarrassing to say that my six-year-old is on his third generation iPad and has actually even taken my iPad 4 because even though it looks like an iPad 3, he knows it's an iPad 4 and he doesn't want to have that. He wants to have the iPad 3. So I'm extremely embarrassed to, to, to say that. But nonetheless, the way the kids are thinking and they're exploring with it, you know, he does a lot of creative stuff on that iPad. So I actually don't mind because he's so creative with it and he tries to do so many things with it that I think it's fascinating. But I do, but kids are literally born into technology right now. I mean, from a very, very early age, they are interacting with technology as we all know. And if you've got kids and you've got an iPad, um, you know, you really are doing it. Now, of course, the next evolution goes much further than this. This is just touch. But, you know, I work with a lot of, um, I'm lucky to work with a lot of researchers around the world. And a lot of the other sensors are obviously coming into play, right? Obviously, you have Google Glasses, and uh, you may laugh about Google Glasses, but Google Glasses very much is the future. And you have a whole bunch of new wearable technology coming through. You have smell, um, you know, technology, you've no idea what it can, you know, in terms of translations and that. Smell, you know, touch, sight. And of course, if you look at stuff now, uh, there's a lot of brain control technology coming out. I have a friend of mine in, <laughs> in Japan who um, does a lot of um, work in this area and has got a booming company in Japan while well, he's a PhD professor, which um, has these little ears on top. I've got to, I forgot to put it into the presentation, but these little ears and they're, control, they're controlled by a little brain device and they basically are connected to your emotions. And so if you're sad, the ears droop. If you're really happy, the ears perk up, right? And he's making a force. Of course, it's Japan, right? So, I mean, but the, the, there are these little ears popping around parks in Japan. Um, and, but it's very, very interesting how, like, I mean, literally, you can imagine kids in the future with a little, you know, little device there. And I will know as a teacher if they're sad, if they're upset, if they're stressed, etc. Literally, I don't even have to ask them. I will literally have that information coming into me. And you know, it's fascinating to think about what that actually means in terms of the interaction with a kid. So, um, and you know, I, 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 I absolutely 100,000% believe in this. I mean, I mean, what is this now? A 5,000 year old dictum? And somehow in the 5,000 years since this was actually, since Confucius said this, which is so true, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do. And I understand, in the last 5,000 years, people have totally forgotten this. And for some reason, our kids are thrown at, still thrown into rote learning, still thrown into like, test after test after test, and are still like the whole concept of actually having to think about something and do something is, is terrible. I mean, I've tried to get my kid into like, what I consider to be a very creative school in London, but he's still got a stack of homework, which probably... At the age of six, he's got an hour to do it at night and he's got probably another half an hour in the morning. And he, if he doesn't do that, he'll never keep up. So, you know, where does he get the chance to go and do and create and change things, you know? That's going to be coming from the home a great deal until the education system somehow manages to evolve and catch up. So, you know, we, when we started, when I started to do this company, I went out and I basically asked um, lots of parents, lots of kids, lots of teachers, you know, 
and tried to get a real picture of actually what was going on. One of the things I thought was most important was to ask the kids because I always find it fascinating how 40-year-olds are generally preaching to the world about what like, an eight-year-old is doing when they have zero clue. And, and often they don't even have kids themselves or the kids are way past like, you know, 20 plus or something and they're like, how on earth do you know what kids are doing at the ages of eight? And so, and I think that, so we went out there and, and really researched and plus we also researched very heavily into parents and it's fascinating again how parents change, right? So when I was coming back to that talk, the thing about like there's a hundred, you know, a hundred billion dollar supplementary, you know, non-school education market out there. It's fascinating how mums and dads are very different, right? Especially in the US. So dads are like, you know, why should the kid play like education? I mean, why should the kid play games in any way, right? Why should the kid spend any time on doing you know, things that are not very, very focused on exactly what he's supposed to be doing in school. Against, you know, the maths and the English and the science, etc. And so they spend a lot of money on these, like, external courses like the Cumon courses, etc. And, you know, big sort of smart, you know, big sort of like human tutoring classes. And there's very little engagement from the kids. And they wonder why do the kids get engaged? Um, don't get engaged. While mums are completely different. Like, I remember when I was asking a lot of mums about this and we were saying that we were building these educational games and they were like, yeah, but is it fun? No, 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 really, is it fun? Because I've, most mums have spent so much money and they're the ones who really spend the money on stuff which the kids just don't get engaged with and they're sick and tired of it and the dads don't really understand that and the mums really do understand that. And, and it's very fascinating how there is a, a very sort of traditional viewpoint from the dads and a much more understanding and creative viewpoint from the mums, which is my point. It's like, I mean, I think mums should pretty much run the show. So, so we looked at pretty much around how kids are doing by doing and creating things, um, you know, how, how important accomplishments and reward is. I mean, look, of course, teachers know exactly how important accomplishments and rewards are, but it's extremely important to get it into the software very, very early on. And by learning from others, mentors are super critical. How, I mean, look, eight-year-olds learn now how to develop their own Minecraft servers, right, from other eight-year-olds, right? And nobody has a clue. Dad certainly doesn't have a clue how they did it, right? But trust me, there are eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds out there who are running Minecraft servers, and they were told how to do that by their mate at school. And, you know, that's a mind-blowing concept in its own right. And again, comes back to how on earth does a school keep up with that? And then finally, you know, there is a super, super critical viewpoint, of course, in the content and the brands they like and respect. Like, kids are very, very brand conscious, m even more brand conscious than ever beforehand. You know, my, my kid gets very upset if I don't use... Um, you know, finish dishwasher tablets in our dishwasher because that's what Sky tells him to do. And, and so, like, how do we, like, they're so conscious of brands and their explanations of brands. And, of course, you know, from the Marvel universe, et cetera, et cetera. So that is super important as well. And I think that if, you know, what's happening now is that Disney and EA and everything have started to realise that, um, a Marvel character telling you how to solve a maths problem is infinitely more engaging than some sort of created thing. And, and again, like just by able to use those characters in other ways, you're finding, we're finding that Disney, EA, um, Pixar, Zinger, all the big studios are, are really realizing what the power of their brands are and are starting to move heavily into education. There's a lot of money being poured into edutainment or educational entertainment. Oops. So we did very well with this app and we got it out there and we give you certificates that we share with your friends as you get through and you type to stay through. And you know, we got, it was fascinating to see the deep, deep level of engagement that we had with kids. We would bring, bring it out into schools around the US and the UK and into Asia and the kids would literally light up. And they were, like, they were very skeptical to start with. Oh, what's this, you know, learn to code game, et cetera. And, you know, they're just watching them light up was absolutely brilliant in itself. But, you know, we're not the only guys out there. There's a raft of things going out there, particularly the king of math, 
I love the King of Math one. The King of Math is super, super clever. It's very, very socially driven. It's very encouraging. It's got a whole bunch of characters. Your character starts as a peasant. And if you manage to learn enough all the way up through maths, you become a king. And if you don't, you become the court joker. And, you know, and it's that sort of very clever way of relating through characters you're building because that's what they, they're very into that sort of building of aims. And then Sushi Monster, my six-year-old loves Sushi Monster. Feed the Sushi Monster and he's got to feed him maths. And the Sushi Monster is brilliant. And, you know, you can see down here how, you know, the whole thing today scores, you've unlocked new levels, you know, all that type of social area is what's going on. Now, you've got to think about it. The kids are playing this stuff at home. So when they come into school, they're thinking about this from this viewpoint as well. They're thinking about like, you know, we'd love to see that type of, you know, level. They're used to levels. They're used to characters. They're used to rewards. They're used to unlocking things. They're used to so many things like that. And I think that with some subtle changes within the, um, within the school and the education system, these things can actually come into the school without doing too much. It's very easy to do. You don't need to over-digitize, but you know, just putting some change and stuff in there is a fascinating thing to do. And of course, my, my favorite is Minecraft, and I think Minecraft is incredible. Minecraft is not just about building and creating, and of course, it's come into... Minecraft never made is all over schools now. But my, what's very interesting is how it got there. Minecraft made no attempt to, well, Mojang, the studio, made no attempt to actually go to the education uh, system. Because, you know, there is a bureaucracy at the education system above the schools which just never lets anything in. But what happens is you've got a whole bunch of very smart and well-connected teachers down here who are very into blogs and networks, et cetera, like EdSurge, who, who see what's going on. And they saw that kids are getting picked up. Some guy, some teacher writes a post and it goes viral right across the teacher network. Teachers are starting to pick it up. And you know, what's, what I hope will happen now more and more is that you know, teachers themselves sort of like just get on with it and sort of kind of bypass that bureaucracy of management that's sitting above the top of them, kind of like you know, the NHS type of thing, and just get on with it themselves. And I think that's certainly what we see happening more and more. So if I was to look at really where, you know, after the end of it, where we saw, you know, learning going and the future of learning. So 20th century, 21st century skills is, is really, really critical. You know, the kids are not stupid. The kids are extremely savvy. You know, we met 14, time and time again, 14 and 15 year olds who realized that what they were learning at school was not going to equip them for what they were going to get out there on their, uh, when they went to the market themselves. And they realized they have to do it themselves. So there's a whole bunch of kids out there who are literally learning by themselves or learning using tools that are digital and online tools outside of the school system simply because they know that to get somewhere these days, they've got to have better and better STEM skills, certainly coding, better science skills, you know, and also what they're starting to realize is how much design and business skills they need as well. It's fascinating to see how many kids, you know, who were approaching us because of the Sumley thing we did, who were approaching us and just going, you know, I'd love to start a business. I, I've just been thinking it in this way. You know, this is, I'm thinking of putting on angel list. I mean, the number of 15 year olds who wanted to go on angel list. I mean, like, huh? And it was just, it's brilliant. And it's like, they're thinking about it in so many creative ways. They're thinking about design. I mean, again, you know, I had kids coming along and going, I've just, I've got some designs from on 99designs.com um, and, you know, I'd love to take a look at them. You know, they're very fast at figuring this out. But very, very crucially is creative problem solving. And what we do see is, is actually one of the, one of the good things in um, the, the US in particular is that the US has been so, the US education market has been so beaten up because you've got every entrepreneur and every investor in there is telling, telling the US market that they're absolute, the education system, they're absolute rubbish. And they've been so beaten up when they're not really rubbish at all. I think it's actually a very good system. But, but they've actually decided, but they've actually changed dramatically and they're starting to bring a lot more creative problem solving and, and work into the schools far more so than beforehand. And there are these you know, great schools which Apple are supporting and Google are supporting. You know, there's you know, showcase schools where you know, the, the change is dramatic. 
um, and particularly focused on problem solving rather than just rote learning. You know, do you understand this concept? How do you apply it into problem solving? And actually, what they're doing is they're getting their kids into the top school, into the top universities and top colleges much, much better than they used to beforehand because those colleges and schools are changing their admission criteria to be focused on problem solving. So that comes down to what I think is so important is that never, more so than ever is understanding core concepts. Like, you still have to make, you have, still have to have conceptual understanding to make connections. And now these connections, the connections you have to make are so intense. You've got to make a connection between, if you're going to be out there and you're going to be immediately going into the workforce, you've got to make a connection between design, between business, between code, between art. You know, as a, you know, you've got to have a much more rounded education to it. I think as well is that what's fascinating is how creatives are starting to understand that they need code and they need maths because maths and code is, you know, as things go more digital from a creative viewpoint, they need those skills in order to change things, to Photoshop things, to actually even write code. A lot of creatives are starting to write code themselves. And now you see creativity coming into code, which I think is, again, really, really interesting. And then how, like, science and maths has to understand design because they're being forced to by just the very nature of their positions. So I think you know, understanding core concepts is still something that is not coming through in the system at all. Um, and it needs to get there better. And that hopefully assessment comes by creating and doing. You know, not by rote learning, not by multiple choice tests, by, by actually doing something. And if you do it, cool, we, you actually understood the project. You know, and I, do, I fundamentally cannot understand why that cannot come in as part, at least part of the assessment criteria, rather than just you know, spitting out an essay or doing stupid multiple choice questions. Um, and then, you know, I think this is, <laughs> this is the one that I, came, I started with and is still the biggest issue. The kids are so much more digitally savvy than the teachers. And, you know, what possibly possible thing is a, te is a student, is a kid learning when they're having to teach their, <laughs> their computer science teacher how to do things, right? Aside from some teaching skills themselves, not much at all. So the schools have to try and adapt into that and try and figure out how those skills can come across. And then at the end of the day, parents are going to play an increasingly important role because unfortunately, the system cannot keep up at this stage until something fundamental changes in the way it's done. And parents are going to be playing a bigger and bigger part. And they, they need to understand that their kids, you know, like Nick, are sitting in their bedroom and they're not just, you know, just playing computer games. If you can encourage them to get off just playing a game and get into coding, getting into writing, getting into doing things, sending them off to classes, etc., you know, and all that stuff like Girls Who Code, Code Dojo, all of those fantastic you know, um, things coming through are, are very, very good. But you know, the only thing I will ever add is that is change. So you know, at the end of the day, whatever we are going to try and regulate now into the system, by the time it's done, the kids will have, you know, the, system, the digital um, world will have moved on. So somehow that has to keep up. You have to almost have the thought of, a someone in a company right now or in a business right in a startup right now who constantly has to keep up with what's going on that type of mentality that startup mentality in some ways needs to go back into the education system so the kids can keep up or the system can keep up but um, with that that's the end of my little rant uh, for the day um, if anyone's got any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Please raise your hands if you would like to ask some questions. Hi, 
Hi, Frank. That was, that was fantastic. It's really great. I'm currently doing some careers outreach work for the VFX film industry, actually. And looking at your last list, I'd also add on to there an issue about not having enough careers advisors out there, letting young people know, and also the parents who are going to help the kids to make those decisions uh, for their careers, what opportunities there are. Because obviously, all the kids who might have these skills may not go to become entrepreneurs or coders or you know, app designers. The skills that they have are actually very transferable. But unless the kids are given some direction or given a, a, a menu, a palette of what they can do, it's very, very limiting because you don't know what you don't know. And we need, you know, here in the UK, there's a very big issue because government has cut, you know, careers advisors out of there. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, until the government comes back, I mean, you're, uh, absolutely. So how did, until the government comes back in and sorts that issue out, um, there's only two ways for the kids to find out. It will be the parents or the kids themselves. So if we take the parents firstly, I think there needs to be much more information targeted at parents in terms of telling them from a careers viewpoint what their kids can do. I think you're absolutely right. You know, again, coming back to that point of at 11 and 12, they start panicking and, you know, what the hell is my kid going to do? Um, and at 14 or 15, uh, the, they may be having exactly that discussion. They don't know. So I think there is a very interesting space out there, you know, from a startup perspective, I, I would say, in terms of a startup that is able to provide information to parents. And that's pretty lucrative business anyway, because parents, you know, mummy blogs spend, you know, get a lot of money. But I think um, that space is, there's a, there's a business there for something to give that to the parents. Second one is the kids themselves. I think what hap you're absolutely right. There's this gap between, there's this cool startup or like world out there. You're 14, how on earth do you get to that spot? Um, a, without having to go to Stanford University. So I think that gap is very true. Um, and again, I think probably in the same way or the similar type of thing, there is a much, there's a huge need for a site that just can explain that and show the kids the path. It's a very good idea. I might think about that. <laughs> uh, thank you for your <coughs> talk. It was amazing. <laughs> Uh, no. But Thanks, uh, mainly you uh, were talking about children. Uh, what about universities and students and uh, maybe the people who are a bit older and uh, are not keeping up with the Already industry? You know? No, no, yeah, I'm joking. <laughs> I, I, well, not... <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, uh, the ones who, who maybe finished university and so on, but uh, what they were doing before is not in the, you know, like in nowadays economy. They are not useful anymore, <laughs> so uh, how to embrace them? Uh, do you think that uh, the fun way is still the same way that should be done? So, I mean, unfortunately, so, you know, I think the, 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 the definite unfortunate thing is that an arts degree does not go as far as it used to, without a doubt, um, which is a shame. Um, and is, you know, that, that is going to need to get fixed because otherwise no one's going to re remember anything to do with, you know, culture or anything. So I think that's an issue. But I do think that the unfortunate nature of the beast at the moment is that there is a huge amount of demand for digital jobs and there are very, very few people who are trained to do them. And so, you know, startups spend an awful lot of time trying to find the right people and there's all these people out of work. So... You know, that needs to get fixed. And I think, to be honest, I mean, it is retraining in some way. You know, it's not that hard to go and do this. Um, you know, there's a, there's a great bunch of guys down here called Freeformers here in London. And what Freeformers do, it's started by a wealthy entrepreneur. But what he's done is he's taken kids off the street. Um, well, I mean, essentially, you know, I mean, not literally, but what I mean is, you know, kids who generally would just be running around on the street um, and change them into digital kids, basically. So he's put them through hardcore programs, etc. And then what he's, what he's now got is a fantastic whole thing. It's apps, a combination of apps for good and, um, and freeformers. And so he's got you know, a bunch of kids from Hackney who are teaching you know, executives in Vodafone how to code. Um, and so I do think it's entirely possible. But again, unfortunately, that's a private entrepreneur doing something 
to change. I don't think the government the government wants to, but it doesn't actually understand how to do that. But I think, to be honest, mate, you just got to go. People just got to go out there and retrain. You got to go and you just get onto, you know, onto the sites and and relearn. Uh, thanks for the talk. It's very inspiring. Um, so we talk more about education system and the new kind of the new style of technology in education really benefit students. But what about what about the employers? I mean, in terms of the employers, I still believe that they they are in doubt of the new style of technology. For example, like in a traditional school, you got tests, you got exams, and you got transcript to prove that this is a good one. But for the online education, I, I don't see you you have something like to prove that how how is your approach current approach to solve that to solve that problem. So how how educate how companies and employers can start no, how to... the um, new new system trying to change that problem. Okay, so I think um, if to so firstly, I mean employers employers. Well, there's there's two issues there. So em, employees also need to relearn and retrain, and also employers need to figure out how to find the right people with the right skills. Um, and I don't think either of those things are solved yet, but there are sites that are starting which show, which help employers figure out what skills somebody has. So there's kind of evolutions of LinkedIn now, which are starting to, instead of just, this is my CV, it's like, this is my work, this is what I'm capable of doing. But I think, um, when it comes to employers, is that the question around? Yeah, employers. So I think employers are, that's a, that again is, a, you know, an interesting one. So, you know, some, there's some companies in the US, in San Francisco um, at this stage, which are basically what they've done is they've built, they've bought a few buildings. Um, and what happens is that companies send their employees over for like 30 days so say someone like from AT&T or Verizon or something like that, sent in for 30 days, and they've got to live inside the building and then there's a whole bunch of startups and digital stuff in there and they've basically actually got to do something. They've actually got to create something, they've got to learn how to code, they've got to actually do something. So I think those type of immersive retraining things is kind of the way to do it because without that understanding of, because if you think about it, someone who's 40 years old who's not into digital, you know, it really does need a quite a heavy retraining system and it needs quite an immersive system, I think, rather than just literally, hey, just can you try and do an hour after work or something? It just It's quite hard to do it that way. So I think a more immersive training exercises need to be done. But we, I see that all the time with companies wanting to do that now. They do want to do that. And again, that's a pretty interesting business for people coming in and helping companies retrain their employees in effective ways into digital. We have one more question here and oh, another no, no, one. I hope I answered the question. Hi, um, thanks for a great talk. It was very interesting. Um, I generally get very excited about things like this, you know, talking about education, future education, but a thought just popped into my mind. So going back to the kids issue is computers have been around for like the good 20 years, right? Uh, I didn't widespread in, in our homes, you know, like uh, in the 1990s, we still got computers when I remember when I was like something like eight or seven years old, there were still computers and there were games, but the educational games were not as much widespread then and still haven't been so much in 2000s. What, why do you think that the iPads or why do you think that's changing right now? Why do you think that the future is going to be these things changing, but it hasn't happened before? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, I mean, if you look at if you look at the App Store now, particularly the iPad App Store, I mean, there's only two things that Ed Apple really concentrates on, and that's education and games. I mean, they concentrate very heavily on education. They promote educational stuff very heavily on the front page, and they also promote games very heavily on the front page, and not that much else. And the reason is, is because both of those are very lucrative for them. So they make a lot of money out of those areas. So education, educational products now drive a, a vast amount of the App Store business. And if you look at educational products, a lot of it is not free, it's paid for. And, and it's because kids and parents are paying, are, are paying. They're, they're buying this stuff. And I think 
What's happening though is that the quality of the product is just vastly improved. I mean, again, you, you know, some of those examples I was showing you beforehand, but I mean, very engaging, very social, a lot of thought going into it. Um, you know, they're just, just better and there's a lot of them, but also developers are making a lot of money out of it. So the good developers are spending their time on it. Um, and that's certainly interesting. And then what also happens is that Apple cross subsidizes those apps into schools. So, you know, Apple, Apple, I mean, the education team in Apple has a whole building by itself in Cupertino. Um, and, you know, there's a massive drive from Apple in there. Google is a similar way. And so there's a big battle in the classrooms for between Apple and Google and to a lesser extent Microsoft on who can get their devices into schools. So what's happening is there's huge incentives for developers to develop good educational apps. And therefore, of course, you start getting much better quality than you did beforehand in the old days of just throwing it out on disks. So it's a big ecosystem. It's very lucrative. Hi, Frank. Yeah, great talk. Thanks again. Thanks, mate. Um, now you're in education, though, can I admonish you on your 200,000%? Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, given what you've said uh, and talked about the collapse of the curriculum and people like Khan Academy, can, can you see a future in the distributed education that you talked about? Can you see it still coming in that direction only? So, I mean, so, I mean obviously, absolutely, distribution of information, but do you mean in those sort of... Well, I'm wondering if the kids are, are start going to use all these devices to find out what they want to find themselves and that the future is in actually helping them find it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, with the huge amount of information. So that's where the next step's going to come in, where these kind of smart tutoring systems or AI-driven interfaces will come in. And absolutely, they will start... They'll be character-driven or they'll be, you know, AI-driven. But eventually, you will have something like Hal who will be sitting there and helping a, a, a kid learn um, and answering the questions for him. I mean, which is, you know, it does, it will get to the point where you just go, Hal, can you help me do this, right? Which is when information then becomes so ubiquitous, it really does come down to, okay, what am I going to use that information with and how do I create new things? So for me, the important thing is absolutely there will be that point, but I do think the next stage, even further than that, is how do I use that information? How do I make connections and how do I do things? So there's one more there, yeah, no worries. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, well, uh, like uh, new ways of uh, education are the reason why I'm here. I want like on the campus party. So also if you are interested in education, I want to talk to you all. But uh, my question is, uh, well, uh, my teachers and uh, also uh, like people in government uh, who decide about like strategy and uh, where we are going uh, weren't born digital. So uh, do you think there is a way to get uh, like um, this kind of revolution in education uh, fast enough to schools uh, like through uh, these people, like kind of, or we have to wait till people who were born digital, who understand how important it is uh, to use uh, technology, uh, will grow and will teach uh, how to use it. So I think, so one of the things that I'm doing with schools or systems right now in terms of just helping is, is that what we try to do is think about it from, you can't, some of the kids are going to be smarter than the teacher and some of them are, those, some of those kids are, you know, some of the kids are not and some of the kids are going to be struggling. So how do you balance that out? And I think it comes, what it does is it really comes back to what you should do is you, you let's think about you put into a whole bunch of kids into a space and they've all equipped with iPads and they've all got to do something specific. Um, and instead of the teacher actually teaching them, literally just let the kids go and do it. And what the, what the feedback mechanism from those iPads should be coming back to the teacher, telling them which kids are struggling, which kids aren't. But then also, how do you encourage mentorship? How do you encourage other kids to teach other kids? Because there one, may be one kid who's lucky enough to have, because their parents are you know, buying them the right kit, and one kid who's not. So how does that help? But I think rather than the teachers trying to be in the middle, you have to assume that these kids are 
so smart now, so advanced that you just let them get on with it. And what you try to do is then you come in in a much more collaborative nature and try to help them and watch them rather than saying, right, guys, I'm going to teach you how to use a, a mouse. Like, that's pointless, right? So let's move on from that type of education and get it in there. So I think that type of stuff has to, is the, is the way for, ha for, so that teachers shouldn't feel like they're always trying to keep up with things mm -hmm. because they might say, hey, Johnny knows how to do this. Great, you're going to teach the rest of the kids how to do that today rather than me trying to figure it out. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I think you have to try and do it in a different way. Okay, I hope uh, teacher, all teacher will understand that concept that it's not like wise men talking something and delivering, uh, delivering the content, but uh, that uh, kids uh, will like find it. Well, and, teachers, I mean, yeah. kids still have a natural huge respect for teachers, right? So yeah. I think what if the teacher wasn't put under so much pressure to keep up with so much information and do so much administration work, that's where the problem lies, right? And so if... If the, if the teacher was able to step back and allow the, you know, in a curriculum viewpoint to allow the kids to teach other kids and encourage that in different ways, it puts less pre pressure on the teacher, right? And then they, their job is to find cool new things that will excite the kids, right? And then the kids go, wow, you know, Mr. Stevens found this yesterday, right? To, you know, told us about Minecraft, right? I mean, that's kind of how it's got to work. Mr. Screams may not even know how to play Minecraft, but he knows that some of the other students are figuring it out. Let's just put this in front of the kids and the kids go, wow. You know, that's kind of how it needs to work, I think. Okay, thanks. We have a few minutes for one more question. Yeah, no worries. That's why I ended early. <laughs> um, it's a great uh, talk you just gave. Um, thanks, who's, who's gonna be the um, gatekeeper? Like, uh, you know, you can build a, a game that teaches uh, someone how to you know learn math but um, you know maybe uh, one that doesn't emphasize core concepts or, or you know like h how do you uh, w what's the quality assurance and how do like oh, teachers yeah. know that this really fits well into the curriculum we're trying to teach there is none right which is the beauty of the internet right is that of course there is that that is the beauty of it but that is also the problem of it right is you're absolutely right how are those games better than any other games? How does Lum Lumosity, why is Lumosity claims, claims it's a fantastic brain training thing? Is it really? Nobody really knows, right? But it's a very good marketing tool. So I think, you know, that's an issue, man. I have no answer to that. I think, you know, I think at the end of the day, to be perfectly honest, the, the better ones rise to the top because if they're, the, if they're engaging enough, and they're the right method, the kids will get to it. If it's not, it will get, it will get thrown in the door. And, you know, and if it's too much game, and, and you know, if the parents are reasonably involved, they'll see that you know, there's not enough doing. But I think what will come is, the, the, what will happen is that there'll be more onus on reporting. So, like, showing that the kids are making progress. So, I think what will, what will happen is that there'll be onus on the apps to show to parents that they're, they've just, they've, you know, the parents just paid four ninety nine for this. You're actually going, you're seeing results. And so to be honest, it will, it will, like anything, it lifts itself to the top. The ones who actually show results to the parents and the kid can demonstrate, look, I've learnt this, that's the one that will rise to the top and the others won't. So, I mean, it'd be natural selection, I hope. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for providing us with some insights on and the that, future of education. That answer was totally on the fly, and I have no idea, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sam. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you for your attention. I just would like to let you know that our next talk is starting at 4 o'clock, which will be for those who are interested in e-commerce.
Hello and welcome to those of you who just joined us. We have our next guest uh, speaker, Jörg Sutara, who came from Germany to talk to us at Campus Party about culture and KPIs. Please welcome Jörg. Um, hi everyone. Um, as she said, my name is Jörg. I'm one of the founders of Paymill. We are offering uh, online payment for online shops and online services and started actually one year ago in Munich. And in the meantime, we are in 39 countries and everything is developing really nicely. But uh, enough said about uh, Paymill. If you have any